Hi, my name is Tom Stewart. I'm with Cleaning Business today. Um, I'm also with uh, Council Keepers of Charleston. We've um, been in the house cleaning business for uh, for a number of years, but uh, Cleaning Business today is going to be doing a series of uh, Facebook Lives over the next uh, several days anyway, maybe several weeks. It just depends on um, how how things develop with the uh, with the virus, the um, as it pertains to the coronavirus. What we want to do is share with you the best information that we have, the things that 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 we get from our research, and the things that we're getting from other cleaning business owners, and uh, get it out there to you so it'll be useful and something that we'll be able to uh, to use in your business. Um, I've got a PowerPoint deck here gonna gonna share with you this is um gonna be getting into a little bit about what the coronavirus is what we need to know about it as as, as business owners and to kind of set the stage for the things that we need to be thinking about uh over the days and and, and weeks ahead um the coronavirus is, uh, I guess, the, the the common name for 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 this uh, illness that, that that we currently are dealing with. COVID nineteen is, uh, I guess, a more clinical term for the illness. It's caused by a variation of the uh, SARS virus, and it's uh, SARS CoV dash two. Um, there's a picture of it there. I'm sure you guys have seen those before. It's a Viruses are are, are, are are really small, and this is uh, an RNA wrapped virus. And basically, what that means is they're fairly fragile. That uh, just soap and water, if it touches the uh, the membrane of that virus, often is enough to, uh, to to permeate the outside of it and basically render the the, the virus harmless. So that's kind of the the pathogen that we're dealing with. Um, there's a lot of discussion that we've been hearing about are we overreacting to this yeah, as a society obviously in some ways we have been you know running out and buying truckloads of toilet paper and bottled water at Costco doesn't seem to be um, a rational thing to do but but, but people are, are, are afraid um, you also uh, hear a lot of people making an analogy to is this virus really any different than just the flu a lot of people get the flu a lot of people die from the flu and this is true and what i have here is a graphic uh going back over the last 10 years of the number of people who have contracted the flu the uh, number of people that have been hospitalized and the uh, number of people that have been died have died rather so you know any given year you know it could be 21 million and this is just in the united states by the way so going all the way back to uh, 2010, it was like 21 million. 2011, it wasn't as bad, about 9 million. 34 million, 30 million, uh, 30, 24, 29, 45. But those are millions of people here in the United States. The United States has a little over 300 million people in it. So, you know, from a percentage standpoint, it can be, uh, you know, 10% or more of the uh, population that get the flu every year. And out of them, you know, it can be 37,000, 43,000, just depending on the year. Uh, last year, 61,000 people died from the flu. So if you do the math, that's point uh, 0.2% of the population or about two out of every uh, thousand people died in the f from the flu here in the United States last year. This is coming from uh, Center of Disease Control. Um, Center of Disease Control also has estimated what this flu year is going to look like. They don't have great numbers, but they're guessing anywhere from 34 to almost 50 million people will get the flu. About uh, 23 million, 16 to 23, will uh, go see a doctor. Um, I guess bottom line is 20 to 52,000, pretty big range, will die from the flu this year. So if you do the math, there's uh, 327,000, excuse me, 327 million people in the United States, give or take. 
um, based on these numbers for this year, anywhere from 10 to 15% of the US population will catch the flu th this year. And roughly about one out of a thousand will die from the flu this year. So when we're talking about making comparisons with uh, coronavirus and flu, that's kind of what the flu picture looks like. We don't have as clear a picture as what the coronavirus will look like, because quite frankly, it's just getting started in this country and globally. It's, it really hasn't uh, gotten a good foothold yet. But there's this metric that I wanted to share with you. It's called the r not value. And what this measures is um, the number of people, if, if one has a particular pathogen, the number of other people on average that they're going to infect with that. And because basically people spread germs. So how many other people, for every person that's sick, how many other people will they make sick? And some viruses are, or pathogens rather, are very, uh, very contagious. Like the measles, one sick person can get up to 12 to maybe 18 people sick. It spreads like wildfire. Um, seasonal influenza, um, this, according to this study, somewhere between two and three. So one sick person might get two to three more people sick. I've seen other studies that have that number down, like, like here's uh, the H1N1 virus in 2009, which was particularly uh, deadly. It was like one and a half percent. I've seen other studies that says the flu is closer to one and a half percent. So even between studies for diseases that we've known for a long time, we really don't, you know, you can kind of debate how infectious they are. Based on best counts from the data that we've been able to collect from the coronavirus, we're guessing this is a pretty big range now, anywhere from 1.4 to maybe a, a, a tad over four. So apples and apples, you know, I would look at this and say, it's not necessarily more contagious than the flu, but it's not necessarily less contagious than the flu. So in terms of the chance of making somebody else sick with uh, coronavirus as opposed to the flu, maybe it's about the same. But there's a couple of uh, 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 caveats to that I want you to think about. We have uh, a vaccine for the flu. It's not always perfect because the strains change and change from year to year and every once in a while we guess wrong in terms of what that needs to look like. But there is a, a vaccine to prevent or reduce the chance of people you know, getting the flu. Plus, we also have a lot of therapeutics, medicines that we can give people like Tamiflu, and there's a number of them that will make them feel better if they get the flu. Whereas we got nothing for coronavirus. So even when you're looking at this R not value, um, if you don't have a vaccine, then you could argue that that makes uh, a large part of the population at risk. Um, the big thing to look at is the uh, mortality rate. And we really don't have a handle on this at all because a mortality rate is calculated by the number of people that died divided by the number of people that had the disease. And I think that we are doing a pretty good job globally of counting the people who are dying maybe not 100%, but I think that number is more accurate than the number of people that have the disease. Um, testing isn't great. Testing isn't great in this country. We're struggling to, to, to do testing. Um, so if you know the people that die, but you don't know how many people had it, it's kind of hard to get a, uh, a mortality rate. But some of the numbers, if you do this, we've got 4,000 deaths out of 114 cases, that's like 4%. Um, and again, I'm going to go back to what we said with the flu, which is like one out of a thousand. Um, that's like four out of a hundred or 40 out of a thousand. So that would be like 40 times as, 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 as deadly, you know, coronavirus 40 times as deadly as, as the flu. Do not think that's the case. Um, but to say that maybe the death rate is one out of a hundred, once we get all of our data, there's a lot of, uh, people on the medical, for the medical community and who study uh, the spread of, of, of disease think that might be more plausible, which means it might be 10 times as deadly as the flu. So if you would buy into the, the possibility since the, the flu and, and coronavirus are both viruses, and if 
you know, up to 50 million people in the U.S. can get the flu. Maybe that many people in the U.S. could get coronavirus, but maybe 10 times as many people or, you know, anywhere from 200 to a half a million may die from it. And who knows? We don't know anything at this point, but I guess I'm giving some perspective. So if anybody challenges, is this, you know, worth being concerned about? Is this worth planning for? Is this worth getting prepared for? I would say yes, absolutely. But we need to be rational about it. There's no point going out and buying a bunch of toilet paper and, you know, uh, oops, you know, don't don't hoard stuff. Don't don't, you know, do stuff in an irresponsible way. But at the same time, let's uh, let's go ahead and prepare. Um, here's a chart that shows uh, by age group people. And this is data from China. China has the most cases of this uh, by far, although that's starting to, to ch change. But uh, we had up to 50, I guess the, the, the population that had the most uh, instances of the infection is a group, age group 50 to 59, and then it kind of tailed off after that. It looks like really young people aren't real susceptible to it. Even better, young people have a very low mortality rate unlike some other viruses that we've had in the past where young people seem to be more at risk. This is more weighted towards an older population, but you know, I've seen some studies that say if uh, you're 80 years or older and get this virus, you maybe have like one out of five chance of, of, of dying to it or from it. So um, it's really important to protect uh, you know, the elderly to protect uh, other people that are at risk, uh, immune, you know, having their immune system uh, suppressed, you know, cancer patients, things like that, people with respiratory issues, COPD, those uh, populations are much more at risk. So let's talk about this, you know, talking about risk. Let's talk about our businesses for a minute. What uh, what are the risks that we're we're dealing with from a from a business standpoint? Well, from a business standpoint, certainly we're at risk of of losing clients. We might have clients who come to the conclusion that having people in their home is creating a chance of, of people bringing the uh, the coronavirus into their home. It's a very real concern, especially if. Uh, the company isn't taking you know reasonable precautions another risk that that we're going to be dealing with is the possibility of uh, supply chain problems and if any of you have tried to uh, purchase hand sanitizer to make sure that your your staff is being protected you might find this very difficult to do right now as we go forward um, it's not unreasonable to think that there's going to be a lot of supply chain disruption your ability to buy the stuff that you need for your business, and it's a confluence of a lot of things. Um, on the on the personal protection equipment, a lot of it's made in um, China, and you know they've been shut down. And for the stuff that they are making, they need it themselves. Um, a lot of it was also made in Puerto Rico, and they got wiped out by a hurricane last year, and haven't uh, really been able to to get that going again. So there's a lot of things working against us from from a supply chain issue right now. And if a lot of people get sick in this country, then that would just compound the problem. So all that could result in a loss of income for our companies as well as our employees. And we need to be thinking about that and planning for that. We're gonna be talking about that more in subsequent discussions, but you know, we need to make sure that we're doing things that we need to do to maximize the chance that our company is gonna survive, but also be mindful that a lot of our employees are gonna have a hard time uh, you know, taking care of their obligations if they wind up losing income as well. So these are things that we need to consider and and come up with 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 our best ideas to to, to manage. Um, there's a possibility of bad PR through all of this if we don't manage the as as as, as cleaning uh, professionals, as cleaning business owners, if we wind up sending somebody into a home that uh, has the virus or maybe into a home that somebody living in a home has the virus and then they that same uh, technician goes out and cleans a bunch of other homes and winds up uh, making other people sick 
I mean, this could kind of spiral in a, in a really bad way if uh, local press uh, gets a hold of it and starts talking about it. So we need to be thinking a little bit about, you know, if there is negative uh, publicity, negative PR, how would we manage that and, and kind of get a plan together? And we'll be talking about that in subsequent uh, discussions as well. And there's a possibility, a real possibility of uh, some legal liability in, in, in several fronts. And, you know, I've got some information from uh, some insurance companies There's that are going to be sharing. Um, there's some law firms out there that are uh, specializing in writing contracts to uh, support uh, cleaning companies in terms of entering into certain arrangements to help manage um, the, the indoor environment, infection control, and doing it in a way that reduces their liability. So we're, we're going to be talking about all of that in, in subsequent discussions. Sounds pretty bleak, doesn't it? You talk about you know the potential mortality rate, the number of people can get it. It's a pandemic. People all over the world, you know, are, are, are catching this disease, and it looks like it's going to get worse before it gets better. All those risks that we just talked about, but there's a potential upside as well, if you could call it that, um, or opportunities. Let's just just leave it like that. Um, you know. If we do this right, we have an opportunity to put cleaning procedures in place that are actually effective in reducing the chance of somebody catching, uh, you know, a pathogen getting infected with uh, with coronavirus or any other uh, pathogen for that matter. And we're going to be talking about uh, techniques to to do that. We're also um, in later discussions going to be talking about how you can use this to position your business in the marketplace. Um, in recent years, in my opinion, I've seen the industry go in a direction of commoditization where you just throw up a website, throw some low prices on it, and um, just really focus on the marketing components of it without really focusing on the other parts of the business. And in doing that, I mean, when times are good, that's great. But when people are really concerned about cleaning for health and all of the um, you know, aspects of, of and complexities that that, that, that creates and um, what we need to do as a cleaning business in order to adequately uh, address that and exploit that as an opportunity. Um, we have, we can, you know, you got to run your business in a, in, a, in a more disciplined way, in a more uh, professional way. And this is an opportunity for companies who want to go down that path to, uh, you know, not only take advantage of the opportunity presented by this very unfortunate situation, but also, um, you know, make a, a, a greater contribution to to uh, the community, uh, your you know employees, and arguably society as a whole. So, uh, we're going to be be talking a lot about that. Uh, there's a very real potential that the labor market might get a little more favorable. We've all been struggling uh, to find help, and um, it's you know you can look at a lot of industries from you know hospitality to food and bev, a lot of a lot of service businesses. Um, it's reasonable to think in the weeks and months ahead they're going to be uh, reducing their workforce, which would uh, create opportunities for us. Um, some opportunity for for good PR. We talked about bad PR. If things go wrong, well, um, there's a lot of people um, in the local local press, news um, people who are going to be uh, writing articles are going to be looking for for authoritative voices and export experts on coronavirus. And if you can uh, basically put together press releases and, and bundle up your story in a way and get it out there to where people in the media know where you are. It's a really good chance that, that you can get a lot of interviews and all of the good uh, PR that goes along with that. And all of this, you know, adds up to the, 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 the possibility, if you do it right, to be able to increase your income and get better margins, better gross profit off of the income that you're generating. We need to be thinking about a communication plan. And I'm going to mention this to you because if you're not working on it, we all need to be working on it now. Um, you need to be addressing questions that your stakeholders are going to be asking. And um, your stakeholders primarily are your employees and your clients. General community is also a stakeholder. 
but we need to be able to explain what we're doing to keep our employees safe. Your employees certainly want to know that, but the community wants to know that too. Um, for a lot of reasons, you know, you need to be able to demonstrate that you're a responsible company, that you're you're concerned about the community. Every person that gets sick is creating the statistically the the the, the probability that anywhere from one to four more people are going to get sick uh, based on that R not value that we were looking at. So we have an obligation to do what we can do to make sure that everybody stays sick for the benefit of of everybody that's not sick. Uh, the clients are definitely going to want to know what you're doing to keep them safe. Um, and we're going to, going to be talking about ways that, that you can do that. What are we doing to make their home safer, reducing the chance that they're going to catch uh, an infectious disease inside of their home? And basically, you're talking about hygienic cleaning with, you know, sanitizing, disinfecting, using all the proper infection control techniques. And uh, in subsequent discussions, we're going to be uh, getting more into that. Um, we want to know um, what should your employees do if they display symptoms? You need to make sure that's clearly understood. Um, I would suggest it would be a really bad thing if you have somebody who has a clinical case of coronavirus and you're sending them into people's homes and they're cleaning. Uh, that could create a lot of problems. Likewise, if your client has symptoms that they might have this illness, what are you going to do? I would suggest that you want to talk to your clients and have an understanding with them. If anybody in their household believes they might have this virus, that you would reschedule those jobs until everybody's feeling better. Um, we've got some examples of some uh, communications tools and some some documents that are useful and so on cleaning business today if you go to cleaningbusinesstoday.com forward slash coronavirus virus dot downloads um, you can download we've got and this is some example stuff that we use we've developed at castle keepers it's uh just a general letter explaining uh where we are as a company on these questions here uh, there's also a Q&A example. Uh, you're free to use that to whatever extent it's applicable to your business. If I would ask you, just as a matter of professionalism, if there's things in that letter that your business doesn't do that you don't claim that you do, I mean, make, make sure you're being real with people. Likewise, if there's things that you're doing that aren't in the information that we're sharing with that link, I would encourage you to add that. There's also a poster in there from... Um, the World Health Organization, um, actually, I guess it was developed by John Hopkins. Um, quite frankly, I'm not sure if, you know, if it's copyrighted or not, but I put it out there for you to download for your internal use anyway on uh, the appropriate way to, to wash your hands to, uh, you know, maximize the, the, the benefit of, of getting all the, the, the nasty stuff off your, your, your hands and reducing the chance of infection. So... I hope this uh, information has been useful. And if you want to um, you know, know more about this and get more detail about uh, the information that we talked about today and the uh, various uh, things that you need to be doing inside of your business, there's a whole lot here and a whole lot more discussion to come. Uh, we'll be back here uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock Eastern. It's Tuesday, 5 o'clock Eastern. Please. Uh, Join us and we'll um, we'll go then. Thanks.